before listening to this sermon, it would be really helpful if you could read Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 10 and 11, and there should be a link below the screen to access those verses. Now, if you've read that, you'll realise that this conversion, the conversion described in chapters 10 and 11, it takes up a lot of space in your Bible. In fact, it's repeated, the events of the conversion are repeated three times. And the reason that this conversion takes up so much space and is repeated so many times is because it's the most significant conversion in the history of mankind. This conversion is bigger than the conversion of Saul, whose conversion led to Christianity spreading across, across Europe and Asia Minor. This conversion is bigger than the conversion of Martin Luther, whose conversion brought about the Reformation. This conversion is bigger than the co conversion of Billy Graham, C.S. Lewis, Constantine and John Newton, all put together. If this conversion did not happen, millions of people would not have been saved for eternity. If this conversion didn't happen, none of us would be sitting in church on a Sunday. You might not even be listening to this sermon now. This is the conversion of, hopefully you can't quote his name, but this is the conversion of Simon, who also got called Peter. Now don't get me wrong, Peter was already a Christian before all of these events. In fact, you could debate that Christian was the Peter was the first Christian. Peter was the first person who recognised the significance of who Jesus was. And after recognising the significance of who Jesus was, Jesus spoke to Peter these words. Simon, son of Jonah, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter was the starting rock on which Jesus would build his church. Peter was the individual whose vision for outreach would cause millions to be saved. But at the beginning of chapter 10, when we first meet Peter, Peter's vision for outreach was limited. Peter still had his blinkers on. Peter's vision for outreach was focused on the one group of people, the Jews. But in this vision, God calls Peter to look wider, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews as well. God calls Peter to look beyond the in-group, beyond those with whom he is familiar. God calls Peter to look beyond those who he felt comfortable interacting with on a typical day. If Peter ignored this vision, millions of people would not have heard the gospel. And if you are a Christian, if we don't look beyond the in-group, if we don't look beyond those with whom we are familiar, if we don't look beyond those we feel comfortable interacting with, if we don't do this, then, well, it, it's not for me to say, but it's a, not an outcome we should even be considering. Instead, God wants the same conversion that happened in Peter to happen in us a changed outlook that prioritises the salvation of, of all, no matter who that person is. So let's look at, firstly, the vision that brought about conversion. We first meet Peter in verse 9 around lunchtime. He's hungry and he's already decided what he's going to have for lunch. Verse 10, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet bring, being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. To get a sense of what's happening, Imagine it's Christmas Day at 12 noon. 
you've peeled the carrots, stuffed the turkey, roasted the ro roasties, and the gravy is 30 seconds from boiling. And then someone pops their head in the kitchen with these words, I don't know, I just fancy a curry. Now, pick yourself down from the ceiling and let's, let's examine what's going on in your head. A curry? That's not our family tradition. That's not even what we like. The thought of a curry has not even entered your head in the last 25 years of Christmas dinners. And if you look down at Peter's reaction in verse 13, you'll discover that Peter is thinking the exact same. Verse 13, then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The animals presented to Peter were non-kosher, not the traditional foods that the Jewish people ate. This wasn't because of food preferences. These foods were given by God to the Jews to show the rest of the world that they, God's people, were distinct. But now, now was the time when God chose to invite all people to become his people. People from all walks of life were being invited to know God for themselves. And the way God communicated this message to Peter was by removing these food-related blinkers from Peter's eyes. God was basically saying, yes, these foods may be unfamiliar, as unfamiliar as sitting around and talking with a non-Jew. Yes, this might not be what you plan to have for lunch, just like Peter had had no plans to reach out to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, with the gospel. Yes, your taste buds might warm to these foods, just like Peter might have warmed to one group of people more than others. But now, now was the time when God was ripping up these traditions and putting them in the bin. For God wanted to reach out to a greater extent than before to all. God wanted to reach out to all. Now Peter, he initially resisted this message so much so that his vision had to be shown to him three times. It wouldn't be surprise me if we found ourselves resisting this message too. Like Peter, who had already decided what he was going to have for lunch, many of us will have already dis arrived at certain decisions. Perhaps you've already decided the type of people who you'd be happy to walk across a room to talk to those with whom you are familiar. Perhaps you have already decided that all the people who will be saved are already in church buildings, i.e. there's no point in even trying to reach out to anybody else. Perhaps you've already decided the lengths that you're willing to go to reach others, those who you've got contact with, but nobody else. Perhaps you've already decided the type of church that yours is, no rap music, nobody too dysfunctional, no one who takes too much work. We've all reached some kind of decision about who we want to see saved or who we believe God can save. But through this passage, God wants to remove all these blinkers from our eyes. God wants to invite all people to become his people. God wants us to reach out to people from all walks of life. That's why the most important conversion takes place first in here, not out there. For only when our outlook changes in here will anyone out there be reached. So what does this mean practically? Well, I don't know what it means for you, but I know what it means for me. It means that when we're holding one of our outreach services at a local residential home, I'm to do the thing that I find the most difficult, to talk to those I don't already know. 
It means that I'm to invest in anybody who walks through the ch doors of our church in the next 12 months, trying to get to know them, even if they're not the type of person that I'd naturally warm to. It means I'm not to be so blinkered in my outlook that I only talk to non-Christians if I happen to bump into them. Instead, reaching out to others is to be a priority that I actively pursue. I'm saying these things out loud because I know that if I don't, my blinkers will remain in place. So I'd encourage you, no matter how hard, to think about what your blinkers are as well. Just come up with one, write it down, and pray that God would help you work on this in the coming year. So that's the vision that brought about conversion. And now we're going to think about the conversion that brought about vision. Now, not only are these events repeated three times, but Peter's full name is constantly repeated too. In verse 5, we're told that Simon was called Peter. In verse 18, we're reminded that Peter was Simon's alternative name. In verse 32, our memory is jogged. Did you know that Simon was called Peter? In chapter 11, this fact is repeated yet again. Guess what? Simon's other name was Peter. We are constantly reminded that Simon's name got changed by Jesus to Peter. We constantly remind this because of Peter's rock-like role. Peter meaning rock. Peter was the starting rock on which Jesus would build his church. And Peter was to set the vision that the church, ours included, was to have. This vision being the salvation of all. The vision of the church is the salvation of all. Now, please forgive me for my pride, but I couldn't help thinking that God could have used a better example than Cornelius to share this vision with the rest of the church. And I mean, if it was my job to underline the fact that God wanted to save all people, I'd have chosen the most extreme outsider to religious things. My version of chapter 11 would have gone like this. God sent me down a back alley to knock on the door of the person that he wanted me to reach. When I arrived, it looked as though the door had already been knocked down by the police. After stepping over the dead body of police officer Hicks, I tiptoed through the used needles and followed the line of gunshots on the wall. In the corner of the room sat someone who looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame. I introduced myself, and after farting and bel belching, he introduced himself. My name is Damien Lucifer Hitler. I talked to him about Jesus. He broke down in tears, and after becoming a Christian, I returned to my home church to share the news. You'll never guess what, God wants to save all. I really think that my made up example is a much better example of the point that God wants to save all. Even the most non-religious and rebellious, even the hunchback of Notre Dame, who everybody else overlooks. So why, when making the point that God wants to save all, did God use this guy? Verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian cohort. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, whilst he was praying, he had a vision. Now, let's be honest. Did this guy really need saving? Did he really need pointing in the right direction? Did this man really need urgently to hear about Christ? According to God, the answer was yes. Look down with me at Peter's speech to Cornelius, beginning at verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ 
who is Lord of all. You know what you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He has not he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God anointed as judge of the living and dead. All the prophets, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Mankind is so corrupt that even the most virtuous need to hear about God's offer of forgiveness. People need to hear about this offer of forgiveness that comes only through Jesus Christ. People need to hear about Jesus so urgently that even those somewhat on the right track need urgently pointing in the right direction. Sin is so serious that the death of Jesus was the only way to cleanse those we might deem the most socially acceptable. Eternity is so long, even those enjoying the good life now need to have their good life interrupted and told about the judgment to come. God used Cornelius' conversion to stress the urgency of the church's vision to reach all people with the good news about Jesus Christ. Let me paint this for you in a little bit of a picture. Imagine that you've been picked to carry the Olympic flame through the Tyne Tunnel to Gateshead Stadium for the 2022 Olympics. You're surrounded by school children and past Olympians such as Mo Farah and Usain Bolt. Suddenly, someone arrives on the scene with motorcycles telling you that you urgently need to turn around. Aliens have landed in Gateshead. They're running from the other end of the tunnel towards us. They're approaching so fast, these motorcycles are the only way that you can be saved. After announcing this message, they quickly grab a toddler and drive away speedily on a motorbike. They cry out, flee, 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 get on these motorcycles and flee for your lives. Except for you, Mr. Bolt and Mr. Farrer, you can afford to jog your way to escape. These last words, telling Usain Bolt and Mo Farrer that they were relatively safe, just sucked all the urgency and seriousness out of me. Is every, everybody really in danger, or just some? If they can outrun the aliens, perhaps other people can too. Perhaps motorcycles aren't the only way to be saved after all. We might even have time to drop off the Olympic flame first, before we prioritise the coming judgement. Now think how you'd react differently if the man arrived and did this. The aliens are approaching. These motorbikes are the only way you can be saved. After saying this, he put Usain Bolt on the back of his motorcycle and speedily drove off. I am now taking his words just that little bit more seriously. For if e even if even Ulsane Bolt needs a motorbike, then so does everybody else. Now I'm going to make it my mission to urgently get everybody else on a motorbike too. Regardless of appearances, they need to get on. So now I ask you this. Do just the outwardly rebellious need to hear about Jesus? If people are nice and polite, do we really need to hold on to the idea that Jesus is the only way that they can be saved? Do we really need to make outreach that urgent a priority? Shouldn't we just let people stumble across Jesus in their own time? 
if people's life is going well, do I really need to make such a big issue about issues such as life, death, eternity and hell? Let's look at chapters 10 and 11 for the answer. The centurion's life was going well. He was more or less on the right path. He was even regarded by most as a good man. And yet God made sure that Peter saw, saw it as a priority to speak, speak to the centurion about Jesus. And then Peter went and told the church of Jews to make the salvation of all a major priority too. So hopefully that explains why outreach is so much to be part of the vision of every church and every Christian. My prayer for you is that you'd be converted in your outlook if you are a Christian, so you see the prior salvation of others a priority too. And let's never forget, as we go about this outreach, that God is the one ultimately at work. God was the one who set Cornelius off searching. God was the one who went to went before Peter and prepared the way. God was the one who worked with Peter through his objections. God was the one who got the unsaved Cornelius to invite tons of people round to his house. This same God is reaching out to the world through us. As it says in the book of Corinthians, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us.